In our previous lecture, we looked at the meaning of the temple, uh, going all the way back to the construction of the tabernacle in the days of Moses, and then eventually the desire of David uh, to build a temple after the conquest of Canaan was complete, and then finally Solomon's uh, work in constructing the first temple. This temple, which Solomon built, is the one that was lost in the exile, that was burned to the ground by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In this lecture, lecture number five, we will be looking at the meaning of the loss of the temple and what that meant to the people of Israel who now were in exile in Babylon and what hopes for the future may have been there as they anticipated coming back from Mesopotamia, uh, from Persia to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. We will be beginning with slide 43, the loss of the temple. Slide 44. One of the things that is very important to understand is that when Solomon built the temple, a place where God said that he would place his name forever, on the one hand, it sounds almost as though the temple was indestructible, that the future of the temple was guaranteed no matter what, because God would place his name there forever. But actually, that idea has to be tempered with some other things that are also mentioned in the books of Kings and Chronicles. God warned Solomon at the time of the dedication of the first temple that the longevity of this temple was, in fact, dependent upon obedience to the Torah, faithfulness to the covenant. So when Solomon dedicated the temple, the Lord appeared to him and said to Solomon, if you turn away and forsake the decrees and commands I have given you, and this is the language of the covenant, the decrees and the commands, if you turn away from this, then I will uproot Israel from my land. And though this temple is now so imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and say, why has Yahweh done such a thing to this land? and to this temple. One of the problems for the people of Israel is that they wanted to listen to the language of covenant that sounded unconditional, especially the language that was associated with the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of David. And they did not want to listen to the conditional language of the covenant of Moses. So, uh, to Abraham, God said, I will give you this land forever. And to David, uh, he said, I will uh, promise that your son will build this temple and that this uh, temple and this uh, kingship that comes from your posterity will last forever. And yet <clears throat> there were qualifying conditions even to that language that sounded so absolute. Some of the voices <clears throat> that were strongest in uh, telling the Israelites that they must be careful about the way they kept covenant were the voices of the prophets. Again and again, the prophets warned the people of Israel of disaster if they did not keep covenant. And in fact, not only disaster for them personally, but disaster for the land, disaster for the temple, and certainly disaster for the kings of David's line. The northern kingdom, of course, did not follow the temple at all. They devised an alternative system of worship, which did not depend upon the temple in Jerusalem. But the nation of Judah, the southern nation that remained faithful to the dynasty of David, of course, the temple was very central for them. And yet very early, even as far back as the 8th century BC, which was quite a long time before the temple itself was destroyed, even that far back, there were voices that anticipated the possibility that the temple might be destroyed. The first of those was the prophet Micah, who was more or less a contemporary of Isaiah in the 8th century BC. Micah said clearly that, the, that, that, that Mount Zion, the site of the temple, would be plowed like a field. And that's certainly his language that, that talks about destruction. Isaiah anticipates the same kind of thing 
Huldah, the prophetess in Jerusalem during uh, the period of, of uh, Josiah, uh, gave a blistering interpretation of a Torah scroll that was found in the temple. Now, the uh, Old Testament doesn't tell us exactly what this Torah scroll consisted of, although most scholars believe that it probably was the scroll of the book of Deuteronomy since it's in the book of Deuteronomy that there are such clearly outlined curses for disobedience, and one of those curses would be the loss of the land. But Huldah said, as she read this scroll, that all of the curses that were in this scroll would be, in fact, visited upon the people of Jerusalem and the people of Judah if their uh, future uh, trajectory uh, did not change, if they did not change their ways. Zephaniah, also from not too much different in the same period, uh, also uh, about the time of, uh, of uh, Huldah, said the same thing. Jeremiah extensively talks about it. And in fact, in two passages in Jeremiah, chapter 7 and chapter 26, both of these chapters describe a, a, uh, a very uh, emphatic sermon from Jeremiah about the possible destruction of the temple. He actually talked to all the visitors who came to worship at the temple on that particular day. And he said, what God once did to Shiloh, he would do to this temple as well. Now, Shiloh, of course, was the place that the ancient tabernacle had stood, even before the first temple was built. Shiloh was the place where the priesthood lived, and, of course, where the ark was in the tabernacle. But Shiloh was destroyed by the Philistines. And that, of course, is the period when the Ark of God was taken captive by the Philistines. Such a debacle had never been heard of in Israel before, and they were just shattered by this. Now Jeremiah stood at the entrance to the temple, and he said what God once did to the tabernacle in Shiloh, allowing it to be destroyed by the Philistines, he would do to this temple if they did not change their ways. They could not assume that they had some sort of unconditional guarantee for the temple. They could lose this temple. And even though it seemed, as God said to Solomon, so imposing, the day might very well come when this temple would be brought down and disappear. Ezekiel, who was in the first wave of deportees and the first deportation who had gone to Babylon, a young priest uh, who uh, had come from Jerusalem and now was in Babylon and, and took up his role as the voice of a prophet to the people in Babylon, says the same thing. And again and again, he talks about the desolation of the temple and the, the sins of the priesthood in the temple and the fact that the temple could disappear. So there was a whole series of prophets, a whole series of voices who spoke the word of the Lord to the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and said that the temple was not guaranteed that the future of the temple, in fact, could come to an end and that the temple could be destroyed. Slide 45. In Babylon, Ezekiel especially talks about this. One of the things about uh, Ezekiel that is uh, certainly very colorful and very fascinating is his description of the cherubim, uh, which are associated with the temple. You find that in chapter 1, and then you find it later in chapters 10 and 11 of Ezekiel. What Ezekiel talks about when he talks about the cherubim, and they're not immediately identified as cherubim. When you read the first chapter of Ezekiel, you don't know that they're cherubim because that word is not used. But when you get later in chapters 10 and 11, then the word cherubim is used. So you know that uh, by that time uh, he's referencing back to the first chapter. And by the time you get to chapters 10 and 11, Ezekiel shows that the cherubim, which were the guardian spirits of the most holy place, that the cherubim would rise upward and would, in fact, abandon the temple. Ezekiel begins by saying the cherubim rose upward, and the glory of Yahweh departed from over the threshold of the temple. And the glory of Yahweh went up from within the city and stopped above the mountain east of it. Now, if you think about the trajectory, the temple, of course, faces to the east. And if the cherubim rise up from the most holy place and move across the threshold of the temple, that means that the cherubim are moving eastward. They're moving toward the east. They cross the threshold of the temple. 
They come from within the city and stop above the mountain east of the city, which would be actually the Mount of Olives. And then they disappear. And the next time Ezekiel sees the cherubim, he sees them actually in Babylon with the exiles. Essentially what Ezekiel says is that the Spirit of the Lord, which is represented by the cherubim and whom are the eyes of the Lord, that the Spirit of the Lord that resided in the most holy place of the temple was going to abandon this temple and move with the exiles to Babylon and would be there with them in Babylon. And the temple then, being abandoned, was being abandoned so that it might be destroyed. In this watercolor painting that uh, you're looking at on slide 45, which is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts, this is a watercolor by William Blake, who was the uh, English uh, poet and artist. Um, it's a fascinating depiction of the cherubim that you find in Ezekiel chapter 1. If you look at this, you will, you will see that the figure uh, is supposed to have four faces, such as it would have in, in the book of Ezekiel. And if you look carefully, you will see the eyes in the large wheel and the spokes of the wheel, uh, which is probably intended to be the wheels of a chariot throne. And then above, of course, you see a depiction of the figure of God uh, standing above the cherubim. Uh, you see the wings of the cherubim, those that cover uh, their arms and those that rise upward. And uh, uh, while it may not uh, account for all of the details that you find in the book of Ezekiel, it is uh, kind of a very vivid and fascinating depiction of, of what Ezekiel may have seen. Uh, so I've included it here just because uh, of its interest sake, and it, it gives a graphic uh, depiction of, of what you read about uh, simply in words in the book of Ezekiel. Slide 46. Ezekiel's burden in Babylon was to convince the people in Babylon that in fact the city of Jerusalem would be destroyed, and that the temple would fall. No one wanted to believe this. Not only did the people in Jerusalem not want to believe it, the people that were already in exile in Babylon didn't want to believe it. They had come to Babylon as the first major deportation. Uh, the uh, people of Judah in Jerusalem were still maintaining the city under King Zedekiah. And even though Zedekiah was a puppet king to Nebuchadnezzar, there was a lot of hope that at some point God would uh, intervene sort of at the last minute and save the temple and save the city. In fact, time and again, Zedekiah approached Jeremiah about this very thing. On one occasion, he asked Jeremiah, do you have a word for me? Jeremiah said, yes, this city is going to be destroyed and this temple is going to be burned to the ground. That's God's word for you. The very best thing you can do is simply surrender. Well, that certainly wasn't anything Zedekiah wanted to hear. A thousand miles away in Babylon, the community of, of, of Judeans who had been eg already exiled to Babylon had the same kind of idea. They thought that at some sort of magical moment, God would come in at the very last and he would rescue them. He would rescue the city and he would rescue the temple. Ezekiel said, it's not going to happen. Those who say that are false prophets. In fact, on one occasion, Ezekiel says, or the Lord says actually to Ezekiel, son of man, record this date, this very date, which was the ninth year of Zedekiah, the tenth month, the tenth day of the month. And the word of Yahweh was this, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. Now, because Ezekiel lived a thousand miles from Jerusalem, there's no way he could have known about this other than by the prophetic word of the Lord. Those are long before the days of instant communication that we're so used to today. But nevertheless, Ezekiel predicted this. And he uh, told the exiles there that on that very day, they should mark down that date. Because eventually they would find out that that was the day that the siege to Jerusalem began. The Lord said, I, Yahweh, have spoken. The time has come for me to act. I will not hold back. I will not have pity, nor will I relent. You will be judged according to your conduct and your actions, declares Yahweh Sabaoth. And again, the word of Yahweh came to me, say to the house of Israel, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary. 
the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. What the Lord said was he was about to allow the temple to be destroyed. Well, it was a long time between the beginning of the siege and the actual uh, communication that the city had fallen. But eventually, Ezekiel says, in the twelfth year of our exile, a refugee escaped from Jerusalem, made it all the way to Babylon, and said the city was fallen. The word of the Lord through Ezekiel had come to pass just exactly as he had said. And they had marked the day. And when they checked, the day that Ezekiel said by the prophetic word of the Lord was exactly the day in which the siege of Jerusalem began. Slide 47. This slide shows the four major dates that summarize the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. In fact, because of these four days, each of them became a day of fasting for the exiles from this time onward. All of them a day of mourning, a day of grief, a day of recalling the terrible tragedy that happened to Jerusalem. The siege of Jerusalem began on the tenth day of the tenth month, and this is reckoned in the ninth regnal year of uh, Zedekiah, who was the king of Jerusalem at the time. Now, siege is a type of warfare in which all communication and all traffic is cut off from a city. The city is surrounded by soldiers. Um, during that period of time, then the city has to depend upon its stored food supplies. It has to depend upon any kind of water source that it has within the city. And when the food supplies run out, or if the water supply runs out, starvation is spread across the city. In fact, this happened to Jerusalem during this siege. If you read carefully the book of Lamentations, Lamentations indicates that the siege became so horrific that in the latter part of the siege, parents were reduced to eating the flesh of their own children. They had uh, become cannibals because of the desperate circumstances of the city. By the 11th year of Zedekiah, which was about a year and a half after the siege began, the city wall of Jerusalem was breached by the Babylonians. It was breached on the ninth day of the fourth month in the eleventh year of Zedekiah. Once a wall is breached, it's pretty much the beginning of the end. It's very, very hard to keep out the alien armies. And within another month, the Babylonians had taken over the city. They had burned every important building, and they had stripped and burned the temple to the ground. On the seventh day of the fifth month, the temple was burned. This was such a horrific event for the people of Judah because they thought this could never happen. They thought that the temple was sacrosanct. Jeremiah had warned them about this. He had said to them, don't say to yourselves, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, as though you've got some sort of unconditional guarantee that the temple will last. It's just not true. Change your ways, and God may have mercy on you, but if you do not change the trajectory of your covenant-breaking ways, God will abandon this temple, and this temple will be destroyed. And, of course, that's exactly what happened. After the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, Nebuchadnezzar appointed a governor over the city of Jerusalem by the name of Gedaliah. This is the fourth event which uh, lay behind the four days of fasting each year. Gedaliah, uh, who was uh, the governor uh, in place or, or installed by the king of Babylon, was assassinated not too long after he was, he was installed. Uh, there was a patriot, uh, a zealot, uh, who managed to assassinate Gedaliah. And then there was great fear uh, in the city that Nebuchadnezzar would come back and, and pretty much kill everybody that was left. Some of them uh, were so frightened of that possibility that they actually uh, took to their heels and escaped all the way to Egypt and, in fact, took the prophet Jeremiah with them. Uh, Jeremiah ended the last days of his life in Egypt with the group that went to, went to Egypt. 
Uh, but the, the assassination of Gedaliah was the fourth of these dates. So in the end, there were four days of fasting. These four days are referenced in the book of Zechariah uh, in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Zechariah. So there was a fast day on the 10th day of the 10th month to remember the siege of Jerusalem and its beginning. There was a fast on the ninth day of the fourth month, which is the day the city wall was breached. There was a fast day on the seventh day of the fifth month, which is the day the temple was burned. And there was a fast also in the seventh month commemorating the assassination of Gedaliah and the fear that came out of that incident. Slide 48. The destruction of the temple became the most solemn day of the year for the Israelites because the loss of the temple symbolized to them the loss of everything. They had lost their king. They had lost their land. They had lost the ability to perform sacrifice in the temple. And so the fast of the fifth month, which was the month of Av, became the premier fast in Judaism, the day above all other days in which grief was expressed for the loss of the temple. Now, the anniversary of the first temple's destruction was the seventh of Av. However, the second temple, which would be built uh, by Zerubbabel, and in fact, which we are going to be reading about in the book of Ezra, would eventually be destroyed another six centuries later in the time following the life of Jesus. The second temple was destroyed on very nearly the same day as the first temple was, just a couple of days difference. And in A.D. 70, Titus Vespasian, the Roman general, destroyed the temple of Jerusalem, this time the second temple. And this was on the ninth of Av in the first century A.D. The Jews who survived the destruction of the second temple continued to grieve its loss. And by the second century, they had decided that they would grieve for both the loss of the first temple and the loss of the second temple on the same day. And so the fast day was changed from the 7th of Av to the 9th of Av to accommodate the destruction of the second temple by Titus Vespasian. In fact, the Jewish community still today, even in the modern period, remember the 9th of Av as a day of grieving and a day of mourning for the loss of the second temple. In fact, each year, particularly in the conservative synagogues, the poems of lamentations are read in the synagogue on that day, uh, an expression of grief for the loss of the temple. Slide 49. In spite of the loss of the temple, and in spite of the fact that Yahweh had abandoned the temple, Ezekiel predicted that the Lord would return. His glory had left the temple prior to its destruction by Nebuchadnezzar, but he promised to return to dwell among his people forever in a new temple, And this is particularly described in Ezekiel 43. In fact, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel are largely a very elaborate description of an ideal temple, a new temple that would be built. And here, the Lord said, would be the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. It is almost without doubt that this promise of an ideal temple and of the return of the Lord to this ideal temple must have been a powerful motivating force for the exiles in in Babylon and Persia as they contemplated the possibility of returning and rebuilding the temple that had been destroyed. Slide 50. The temple that Ezekiel described in the last nine chapters of his book are depicted here and and reconstructed in a drawing by uh, British scholar John Taylor. Uh, You can see that it is constructed very much like the Temple of Solomon and, in fact, very much like the old tabernacle in the wilderness, at least the main areas of the temple. There is a most holy place. This is, uh, at least in this depiction, would be the area to the left that's marked H, uh, the inner room. It would also have a holy place, a larger room. This one is marked N, which is uh, the holy place that is about double the size of the most holy place. 
And it would also have a vestibule and two pillars, similar to the pillars that were in Solomon's temple, and steps up toward it. Slide 51. As you look at slide 51, you see that this temple would then be surrounded by a, a, an inner courtyard and then eventually an outer courtyard. There's various uh, kinds of things described by Ezekiel, including various rooms called chambers. Uh, uh, in this particular depiction, all of the things marked C would be chambers of some type. Uh, we don't always know exactly how those were to be used, uh, but nonetheless, they were described there. Um, there was also uh, entryways uh, on the east and on the north and on the south. And then there was an outer courtyard. Uh, and then around that, uh, there were other entrances on the east and the north and the south. All of these were the ideal construction that Ezekiel envisioned and that have been reconstructed here in uh, 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 an architectural type rendering by scholar John Taylor. Eventually, the temple that would be built by Zerubbabel in the book of Ezra will be similar to this temple, although not identical. This is a question we don't, in fact, uh, entirely know the answer to, why they did not attempt to build the second temple in precisely the way it's described in the book of Ezekiel. But nonetheless, whether they did or they didn't, the fact probably is, it, it remains that the motivation behind building the second temple was to a large degree due to Ezekiel and to Ezekiel's prophecies that there would be a new temple constructed. Ezekiel, of course, because he was a respected member of the community of exiles in Babylon, uh, would have been well known by the, by the exilic community. And in fact, his, uh, scroll, his predictions and his sermons would have been carefully guarded by them and preserved by them. And so it's more than likely that when the exilic community prepared to come back to Jerusalem from Persia, they would have been very familiar with the ideals that Ezekiel expressed about the building of the new temple. Slide 52. The final word of Ezekiel is actually a compound name for the Lord called Yahweh Shema. Yahweh is there. This final word is a way of saying that once a new temple was built, that the Lord would inhabit that temple and that he would stay there forever. Restoration was God's word for the future. And he would reverse the abandonment of the temple that had happened in the debacle of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar's invasion. So, the Lord's last word was not doom, but in fact his last word was promise and hope for the future. This would have encouraged the exiles as Zerubbabel and Sheshbazzar led the first phalanx of returned exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild. Slide 53. Those who returned with Sheshbazzar would have done so with this vision in mind then. Ezekiel's prediction was recorded precisely, he says, so that a future generation might be faithful to its design and follow its regulations. That, of course, is what they intended to do. During his prophetic ministry, Ezekiel uh, would have been well known, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, so it's hardly to be doubted that those who returned with the permission of Cyrus the Persian emperor believed that their mission had a spiritual mandate. They were going because God had led them to go, and they were part of the fulfillment of the predictions of Ezekiel. So the list of the returning party was, as it says in the first chapter of Ezra, everyone whose heart God had moved to go up to build the house of Yahweh in Jerusalem. God moved in their hearts, through the messages of the prophets, and especially through the message of Ezekiel. And they were ready now to go back and to begin that process. In lecture number six, we will begin with Ezra 1 and the initial move from Persia back to Jerusalem.